past accomplishments of humanity leave an impression of how our future will be framed. For millions of years, humans have been leaving long-lasting footprints to alter the local landscape and ecology in significant ways. We've built civilizations, established language to communicate, and invented devices that our ancient ancestors would have thought was impractical. In due time, the Earth will not continue to offer its harvest, as it is fast becoming unfit for even the noblest inhabitant. As some continue to preserve and cherish this blue dot we call home, it will inevitably be our responsibility to search for a new rock to sustain human life, or we will meet the same demise as elder species of Earth. In this video, we will discuss the why, the reasons we need to search, the where, which are the places we could colonize, and foremost, the how the steps we are taking to get there. We are vulnerable. One of humanity's biggest hurdles is we tend to tackle disasters as they emerge, no matter the extremity, hoping that we can overcome. But what would happen if we encounter a disaster that is too big for us to fathom, where our technological advancements do not suffice, or a disaster that is outside of our control leaves us powerless, Whenever and wherever you are on Earth, there is a constant threat of disaster. Here are some of the things we may face, any time from now, to years into the future that define why a backup settlement may be needed. Cosmic Catastrophe When the sun rises at the beginning of each day, it is an indicator that 24 hours has passed, but also an indicator that we are one day closer to a sunless sky. In about five billion years, the sun will become a red giant by exhausting the hydrogen fuel in its core and start burning helium, forcing the atmosphere to expand. This growth will push the habitable zone, the distance from a star at which liquid water could exist, away from Earth's orbit. The oceans and any liquid on the surface of Earth will be boiled down to nothing. The five billion time clock gives humanity enough time to find a home, but it is a time clock indeed. There are other threats that we cannot gauge. Asteroids are an example. In Earth's history, there has already been five mass extinctions, some more deadly than others, but the most recent one was caused by this infamous rock. The asteroid, roughly 10 to 15 kilometers wide, hit the Earth, sending extreme debris into the air, creating massive tidal waves and vaporizing 75% of life on Earth. Thanks to our advancements in tech, we have telescopes that can detect near-Earth objects and calculate their orbits. Thousands of asteroids cross into the Earth's orbital path, missing us. But it is inevitable that one will eventually catch us. In 1989, a small asteroid, with the impact of 1,000 nuclear bombs, barely missed the Earth by six hours of orbit. Our telescopes have assessed 95% of asteroids as non-threatening, but that still leaves 5% in the dark. Another known possibility of cosmic threat, gamma-ray bursts, should not go ignored. These bursts are explosions, said to be caused by the formation of black holes in the universe. One burst can emit as much energy as the sun in its entire 10 billion year existence within just a few seconds. Not much is known of these events, but if one was to happen in the Milky Way galaxy, it would strip away Earth's protective ozone layer and expose all life to deadly radiation. Speaking of bursts caused by black holes, Black holes are one of the single deadliest cosmic events that we cannot gauge. Unlike a normal star which may emit light from millions of miles away, a black hole gives less of a warning. An asteroid with a trajectory towards Earth may give us years to prepare for impact. Our telescopes can easily capture this deadly rock. With a black hole, it would have to become close enough for astronomers to observe strange changes in the orbits of outer planets. By this time, it may be already too late. The black hole doesn't actually need to come close to Earth to cause damage. Just entering the solar system would distort the orbit of the planets. This event would cause Earth to swing on an elliptical or break orbit around the Sun, sending our home into the cold, dark, deep space. There is also the possible imminence of solar flares. These events, more properly known as coronal mass ejections, are great magnetic outbursts on the Sun that would encompass the Earth in subatomic particles. Yale University found evidence that other sun-like stars can brighten briefly by up to a factor of 20. A flare of this magnitude could, within hours, fry Earth. It is also possible of the opposite happening. 
If the sun were to dim, even in the smallest percentage, it would send the Earth into another ice age. Scientists know very little of super flares and what causes them. The probability of these cosmic disasters happening has been defined through the lens of technology and the minds of scientists, but nothing is precise in the untold nature of the universe. Our fears of what we anticipate beyond shouldn't distract us from the uncertainty of our own planet. In fact, if humanity were to face a near extinction threat, it is most likely to erect from the nature of our own home, or in other words, a natural disaster. As still as the earth sits, as peaceful as the mountains, the hills, the plains, the plateaus, nature is a constantly changing and unforgiving notion. With these changes, come obstacles for the animals who are forced to adapt to a new ecosystem. One of these disasters is the possibility of a super volcano eruption. But what makes a volcano super? A volcano is considered super if it has had an explosion that released 240 cubic miles of material. This area of coverage would put the volcanic explosivity index at the highest level of 8. In the last 10,000 years, there has not been an eruption of index level 8. In fact, scientists have only identified 42 eruptions that ranked this high in a 36 million year history. If one of these eruptions were to happen, it wouldn't be the blast that would kill us, it would be the effects. A level 8 eruption would plume ash and gas miles into the air, cause avalanches and alter the climate. This would lead to crop failure, starvation and disease, killing hundreds of thousands, but not likely to wipe out humanity completely. The other natural disasters we experience, like hurricanes, tsunamis and earthquakes, are often taken more lightly than they should. We have proven throughout history that we tend to wait until the effects of these disasters hit before imperative action is taken. Our preparation and preventative measures are not sufficient enough for the possibility of larger disasters that are set to come. Even then, how much can we really prepare? Our size in comparison to the big blue dot shows how vulnerable we are. The smallest movement of the planet could create a near extinction natural disaster at any time. If we don't have another civilization outside of harm's way, we could be forced into a state of panic, trying to preserve and protect as much as we can. New York University chemist Robert Shapiro contends that the inevitability of cataclysmic events mean we must prepare a copy of our civilization and move it into space as a backup. A disaster of such damaging effects may not kill us off at all, but it could guarantee that the next world war we fight will be with sticks and stones. On the flip side, what would be a more exemplary way to end humanity than death, caused by life? For most of mankind's history, infectious diseases and pathogens were an existential threat, and for good reason. The 6th century bubonic plague swept about 17% of the world's population, in 1918, influenza, or the flu, killed 5% of the world, and malaria has estimated to have killed half of all humans ever to live. As we have gotten many of these deadly outbreaks under control, we have no indication of when the next microbe will shoot its shot at world domination. An apocalyptic pathogen would need two attributes in order to succeed. It would first have to be so unfamiliar that no existing vaccine could weaken it. It would also need a high and surreptitious transmissibility before any symptoms start to show. No deadly disease in world history has successfully met these two requirements. As humans, we focus our minds on the problems posed by disease, and with more knowledge comes more resilience against the pathogens forming in the dark, as opposed to the dangerous, unavoidable shifts of the Earth and the random, unforgiving nature of space. Many disasters have an element of human intent, negligence or error involving a failure of a man-made system. These man-made disasters, known as anthropogenic hazards, expose the blemishes of humanity and can eventually lead to our own demise. Ice is melting, seas are rising, forests are dying and animals are scrambling to adapt. To be such small beings to the earth, we have caused it the most stress. Our modern living conditions release heat-trapping gases called greenhouse gases that have reached levels higher than any time in a million years. These gases rise in the atmosphere and trap heat from leaving Earth into space, causing a change in overall climate. The natural disasters listed before are greatly dependent on the Earth's heat levels. If we continue to emit gases at the current rate we do, the Earth could heat from 5, 10 degrees by the end of the decade. At the present moment, there hasn't been much improvement on ways to make humans more resilient to heat. At 11 or 12 degrees of warming, 
more than half the world's population, as distributed today, would die of direct heat, but the precarious levels of climate change would lead to something far worse and incurable, ecosystem collapse. Billions of years of evolution has produced a world where every living organism's welfare is intertwined with that of countless species. Salmon, a type of fish, are often born in small stream ecosystems. When they are strong enough, they swim out of small streams into large streams and eventually into large rivers. After a few years, they swim to the open ocean for a short time, then retrace back to the small stream where they were born, then they breed and die. Throughout this journey, salmon provide energy and nutrients to these ecosystems, as well as nutrients for predators. The endangerment of one singular species could create a snowball effect for many others. If too many species die out, that snowball effect can most definitely lead back to humanity. While our incompetence is affecting natural species, we are also creating new ones through genetic engineering. Genetically modified crops and microbes can most certainly ease our health problems and fix defects in our DNA. But there is also a downside. When we modify crops to fit our needs, we inadvertently change the way they affect other species, causing more damage to an already stressed ecosystem. Moreover, the development of microbes could become out of control, leading terrorists or large organizations to create deadly viruses for control. This new form of power could increasingly lead to great chemical warfare. In World War I, a choking agent called chlorine and mustard gas which burns the skin were among the chemicals used. In 1925, the Geneva Protocol was signed to prohibit the use of chemical weapons in warfare, but this protocol had many shortcomings. Chemical weapons could still be developed, and they could also be used against those who were not party to the protocol. Poison gases were used in World War II Nazi concentration camps and in Asia. With the creation of the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1993 to enforce more verification, there are still means of creating and distributing a chemical agent undetected, and these agents could easily backfire. It is a continuing debate on whether chemical warfare is more dangerous for humanity over nuclear warfare, as it is difficult to calculate the full scope of damage from a nuclear war. The consequences of a nuclear war would extend far beyond the blast as it is. Smoke from the blast would ascend high into the atmosphere, wrapping the sky in a blanket of soot that blocks the sun's rays. The planet would immediately become deeply cold, crops would die, leaving famine around the globe for years. Electronic equipment would cease to function, even for people outside the blast zone. Hospitals would overflow, and water would become contaminated. While the onset effects of a nuclear winter would begin to dissipate, years later, as the sky started to return, the catastrophic effects of even a localized nuclear conflict would exhibit far-reaching consequences. But suppose none of this happened, and for decades no cosmic catastrophe, no natural disaster, and no changes in climate were able to put an end to the human race. How likely would it be for our own technological creations to try and recreate the world in their own image? Elon Musk proclaims that with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. That possibility is accurate, considering we are dealing with two different technology parameters, smart and intelligent. These parameters are not one in the same. They both start off with subtle differences, but can isolate greatly. Your phone, watch, computer, and any other program technology you own would be considered smart devices. This is because to be smart means to call on a storage of information or facts, either obtained or given, and use it to solve or overcome a particular situation. Assistants like Siri, automated tools and self-driving cars, would be called artificial intelligence, where intelligence is the ability to expound on known information and to find new information which would, in the end, help to procure solutions to tough situations faster than others. If artificial intelligence were to become out of control, the intelligence aspect as well as the ability to store and pull information accurately and the ability to calculate at accelerated speeds could keep a malevolent machine millions of steps ahead of humanity at all times. None of the threats we face are improbable. Mass and near extinctions are proven to have taken place in the past, many of them caused by the topics explained. If humanity wants to survive the test of time, a day must come where more human beings live off the Earth than on it. Earth, unlike any other world, is the only place known to host life and the base of our decision of where we will go next. 
but there are millions of worlds suitable to settle, some more and some less. Here we will discuss five of the most presumable places where we could colonize in the near future. The moon. For as long as humans have gazed in the sky, we've been able to see our cosmic, cratered companion by eye. Scientists believed the moon's surface was completely barren until about a decade ago, when traces of water were discovered, mixed into the lunar soil. Understanding and tapping this water supply will be critical if humans decide to live on the lunar surface. But before we get that far, there are other obstacles to overcome first, such as what will be the source of power. Solar energy panels used on Earth could also function on the moon, but a lunar night is far colder and longer than a night on Earth. Temperatures are intense, going from negative 183 to 106 degrees Celsius, or negative 298 to 224 degrees Fahrenheit. The energy infrastructure we have designed for Earth may not hold up in extreme conditions. The same issue would prevent most energy storage and distribution systems from functioning as well. Other than the immense cold weather, amicable breathing conditions and health of settlers also pose a barrier to overcome. Apollo astronauts found out when visiting that moon dust is sharp and can be nasty. The dust would consistently rip spacesuits and irritate their eyes and lungs. Minerals in the dust react with human cells and create toxic hydroxyl radicals linked to lung cancer. Experiments done have found that a recycling air system would be needed. Oxygen-emitting plants would be placed in lunar greenhouses and the purified air would circulate to habitation pods. This same setup would need to be used to grow food for continuous survival. Sending supplies from Earth would, over time, become costly and inefficient. Settlers will need to completely detach from any dependency and be able to persevere from the moon's resources alone. To settle on the moon would be to restart human civilization. Everything would function differently, from approximately 700 hour long days, to a constant cold, dark, empty view, to an evolutionary distance from the things we love the most. Living on the moon would take time to set in, but hopefully one day, children who've lived their whole life on the moon will look at the Earth as something extraterrestrial. Mars. Humans and their fantasies of colonization on Mars have become progressively tangible with the presence of people like Elon Musk, who plans to have a civilization on the Red Rock within the next half century. But the idea of living, instead of surviving, will pose the most strenuous concept, as the obstacles on Mars are by few but heavy. Mars isn't just a red planet, it's a dead one, and living on it will certainly feel that way. The thin atmosphere of the Red Rock is less than 1%, compared to that of Earth's when it comes to necessary gases for life. 96% of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, 1.9% is nitrogen, and 1.9% is argon. Oxygen needed for humans to breathe, and nitrogen needed for plants to survive is far too little for us to settle here without a supply of air. The thin atmosphere allows the heat from the sun to escape back into space, causing the planet to average negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 63 degrees Celsius, not including the lows up to negative 195 degrees Fahrenheit. To add, the air pressure is far too low, 0.095 psi compared to Earth's 14.7 psi. Without good levels of pressure, tiny pockets of air inside a person's body would expand, causing water in the body to boil and eardrums to rupture. Mars, to become suitable for human civilization, would need to be terraformed, meaning to change the environment to be more Earth-like so that it can support life. In Mars' case, to create a thicker atmosphere, allowing the planet to warm and stimulate greenhouse gases into the air. As of now, our current technology could take centuries to make the Red Rock a red home. The other issue we have with space in general is high levels of radiation. Earth's strong magnetic field diverts most of the cosmic radiation from space back away from the planet, keeping us safe from radiation poisoning. Any time an astronaut is outside of this field, they are vulnerable to extreme levels of radiation and the extended travel time to reach Mars could be detrimental. Experiments are being conducted to create better shields for the long-time travelers. As said by Elon Musk, if an arduous and dangerous journey where you may not come back alive, but it's a glorious adventure sounds appealing, Mars is the place. 
Titan and Europa, with four of the planets in our solar system being gas giants with no surface to touch down on, and Mercury and Venus being too near to the Sun, our options for colonization boil down to Mars and, well, moons. Titan, the largest moon of Saturn and Europa, one of the many moons orbiting Jupiter, have become viable options for human exploration and possible places to inhabit. Titan is the only moon in our solar system with a thick atmosphere, about 95% nitrogen and 5% methane, which is similar to Earth's 78% nitrogen without the crucial 21% of oxygen. It is also very cold for having an average temperature of negative 292 degrees Fahrenheit. The thick atmosphere would make a safe haven for humans, as it would prevent majority of radiation from reaching the surface. This moon has a pressure 60% higher than that of Earth's, feasible for humans to walk on without a pressurized suit. Only an oxygen mask as well as warm attire would be needed to roam this rock. Standing on the surface of this moon would feel like resting at the bottom of an extremely cold pool on Earth. Titan is also covered in water, ice and methane lakes, making one less barrier to overcome. The easily accessible methane could make this moon useful as a refueling point for rockets traveling further from Earth. Gravity here is 14% of the Earth's gravity. Humans would be able to easily strap wings to themselves and fly at their own will, with a beautiful view of Saturn's rings in the sky. This allure, moreover, comes with some problems. At almost 10 times the distance from the Sun as Earth, Titan receives just one hundredth the sunlight which would make crop growth fairly difficult. Humans, in order to sustain, would have to adapt a unique diet of possibly biotech foods. When it comes to rainfall, it can be decades up to 1,000 years in between occurrences. But when it does rain, it comes down harshly, enough to change the way humans live for years thereafter. If we ever plan to settle on Titan, we would have to first perfect a living strategy based on the nature of this moon here on Earth. Jupiter's moon Europa is quite different from Titan as the atmosphere is very thin, similar to Mars. Even though it is composed of mainly oxygen, it is far too tenuous for humans to breathe. Europa is believed to have a vast liquid body of water, 40 to 100 miles deep, beneath a layer of icy surface with the thickness of 10 to 15 miles. But how can it be liquid with the lack of a protective atmosphere? As Europa orbits, the icy surface heaves and falls with the pull of Jupiter's gravity creating enough heat beneath the shell to maintain a liquid body. It is a possibility that the rock may be the best incubator for extraterrestrial life in our solar system, outside of Earth. Colonization for this moon would be difficult, seeing that the lack of an atmosphere exposes the surface to radiation 1,800 times the average annual dose on Earth in just under a day. Settlers exposed to these levels would have over 50% mortality in a month. The gravity is very similar to Titan at 13% of Earth's gravity, and the temperature ranges from as high as negative 210 degrees to negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 134 to negative 223 Celsius. Europa, furthermore, has its own dangers similar to natural disasters on Earth. Ice quakes could occur sporadically, and you would want to be weary of giant plumes of water that violently expel from the ice, sending whatever is above it into space. Scientists don't know anything ample of Europa, other than the fact that it is a uniquely mysterious place. A place with all the ingredients for life, hidden behind glass-like ice. It is a constant discussion of whether a mission to this moon should be for settlement, or to look for extraterrestrial life. The only way to surely know, would be for us to take a risk and explore the surface. Super-Earths the mysterious dark vacuum of interstellar space has long been thought to be a vast expanse of emptiness. Our search for a new home had been confined to the floating rocks in our own solar system, constantly hoping we could uncover a rock that mirrors the composition of Earth. With new scientist discoveries, the Kepler Space Telescope of 2009 and the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite of 2018, also known as TESS, we have been able to peer into the darkness and find new solar systems containing exoplanets described as super-Earths. A super-Earth is an extrasolar planet with a mass higher than Earth's, but lower than that of ice giants like Uranus and Neptune. Over time, we have discovered thousands of these anomalies in their own systems orbiting their own stars. 
A few of these systems have been proven to host exoplanets that are oddly similar to Earth, possibly colonizable with the possibility of being already colonized, but many say different. Many debate that trying to colonize or search for life on a super-Earth would be foolish, and the fact that we call them super-Earths gives a false impression that these exoplanets are actually Earth-like. The distance to them, from Earth, is far too pronounced. Proxima Centauri b, which orbits the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri, is 4.24 light-years away. This means, even if we were traveling at the speed of light, it would be four years there and four years back. Eight and a half years per trip, just to understand what kind of composition we're dealing in. The technology does not exist for this type of travel, and it would be costly beyond means. If there was ever a time where distance wasn't an issue, a distant rock named Kepler 452b may be a worthy visit. 452b is a super-Earth exoplanet discovered in 2015 by the Kepler telescope, and it is the most Earth-like exoplanet thus far. It resides 1,400 light-years away from Earth in the Cygnus constellation. It is 1.6 times the Earth in size, and has a gravity twice as strong, which researchers suggest we could adapt to. The exoplanet orbits a similar star to our Sun at the same distance as Earth. It is about 1.5 billion years older than Earth's Sun, and 20% brighter. But 452b's stronger gravity would allow it to keep its surface water for longer periods of time. Researchers go as far to suggest that 452b may be rocky, with active volcanoes resembling here at home. We would have to get closer to know for sure. There is something deeply mystifying about leaving the sanctuary of what we've known for so long, to discover other worlds we weren't meant to sustain. Worlds of extraordinary size with their own atmosphere, their own cycles, and their own peaks and valleys. Worlds that could care less about the existence of life itself. When explorers pull away from the protection of Earth, the darkness exposes its dangerous nature, the silence of cosmic radiation, the onset psychological toll of isolation, and the unfamiliar effects a new world may place on the human body. In order to even meet these challenges, we will have to improve our efficiency to travel without depleting our only reserves. The pull of Earth's gravity is like a steep wall to climb over, taking a substantial portion of the funds for fuel. The cost of sending anything into orbit would cost around five to $10,000 a pound. Engineers have dreamt up many rocketless launch systems that could offset this limitation. One example is a space gun. By using a giant gun to launch rockets into space, you would only have to send the payload itself without the massive weight burden of fuel. If a rocket was fired at such high velocity that it could break free from gravity, it can then correct its course. On the contrary, you could take a less aggressive approach and ride to space in a space elevator. A colossal elevator extending 22,000 miles from the Earth's surface has been considered a sound concept. The project would cost billions to build, but it could also lower the price per pound to as little as $25. Some time back, NASA had given American physicist Bradley C. Edwards $570,000 to investigate a space elevator device. His findings estimated cost to be 14 billion once the evolutionary nanotech needed for the tubes was invented. An alternate take on travel would be to set aside our standard method for takeoff, chemical propulsion, and progress to electric propulsion. With chemical, a rocket would burn fuel producing gas as a byproduct. Then this gas escapes the rocket with extreme force, propelling the rocket into the sky. Rocket scientists have been working to use methods of electric propulsion, specifically ion propulsion, to bypass the limiting constraints of fuel. Ion propulsion systems charge atoms and then exploit their non-neutral charge to expel them from the spacecraft, creating thrust. With ion systems, less propellant is required, therefore there is less mass added to a spacecraft. As many believe electric rockets are the future, some don't. One of those people is Elon Musk. Back in 2015, Musk released a series of tweets about why his company SpaceX doesn't use electric rockets and why they don't work. For an owner of an electric vehicle company, it comes as a shock. SpaceX has developed reusable rockets with engines that burn a combination of rocket-grade kerosene, called Rocket Propellant One, and liquid oxygen instead of the ion engines. In addition, this rocket works out less than $2,500 per pound to orbit which is a step in the right direction. 
Getting off the ground isn't the only hurdle to cross. The navigation of cold, empty space presents its own barriers. Astronauts on long voyages need to be able to produce their own spare parts, on demand, for routine needs, and to adapt to unforeseen struggles. 3D printing was created to simplify life at home, but now it can be used in space to produce parts quickly without the need of manufacturing. Printers that can accurately produce parts, using a variety of materials, can limit costly trips back to Earth. Engineers at NASA have come up with a way to simplify travel in space with a concept called Comet Hitchhiker. A spaceship would harpoon onto fast-moving space rocks, hitch a ride, disconnect, and find a new rock to latch onto. Asteroids move an average of 15 miles per second, so it would be difficult to catch onto, but a free ride indeed. If that doesn't work, travelers could try more unworldly methods such as wormhole teleportation. Wormholes are space-time connections between distant regions with the possibility of traveling faster than the speed of light. A person entering a wormhole could exit from the other side later than a signal traveling in the space between these two regions. Scientists have no proof against or for them, but they do know for one to exist, it must be made of exotic material with a negative mass. A wormhole could spontaneously exist or be created by the immense warping of time as a result of a black hole a Schwarzschild black hole to be exact. A Schwarzschild black hole has a static mass, no rotation, and no electrical charge making it perfect for wormhole creation. If that doesn't seem strange enough, there is also the idea of using a warp drive in space-time. Understanding of space-time comes from Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity which states, space and time are inextricably connected, and events that occur at the same time for one observer could occur at different times for another. The theory proclaims nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, as it is the universal speed limit. A warp drive is a propulsion system where a spaceship could compress the space in front of it while expanding the space behind it in order to travel long distances quickly. If a ship could travel five meters at one meter per second, it would take five seconds to travel the distance. With a warp drive, you could compress the distance to one meter so that the ship would only take one second to travel a five meter distance at the same speed of one meter per second. Warp drives could be possible because the spaceship would still be traveling slower than the light in the space, and it is definitely something to keep in mind. Work done by scientists conclude that an approach to bypass the constraints of humanity altogether would make trips even more efficient. The idea that comes to mind are self-replicating nanobots. Not only would they be able to travel in ways humans can't, they could travel to a destination, mine for materials, and use those materials to create copies of themselves. Then the new copy could travel further to a new location. This concept would speed up discovery while also being less costly and less dangerous, as no lives would be at risk, or maybe they would. There are some who suggest against the idea, out of fear, that nanobots could become unmanageable. An error in the programming could conclusively threaten humanity. The creation of nanobots, with the ability to replicate, would have to be tested numerous ways for long periods to be sure that nothing evil is developing in the partially sentient brain of a bot. If the Earth ever decides our stay is coming to an end and we don't have yet, the technology needed to colonize elsewhere, there are a few options we may explore. DARPA's 100-year Starship project proposed in 2011 has a plan to make humans capable of voyaging beyond our solar system within the next 100 years. Planning something this eccentric would mean that every aspect of life would have to be simulated on a ship. We would essentially have to take enough of everything so that the ship can function for generations, and repairs would have to be made with parts that need to be produced, or we would need to find better ways to do the things we do on Earth. This is similar to the Alliance to Rescue Civilization plan, created by biochemist Robert Shapiro as an organization devoted to an off-Earth backup of human civilization. With either approach, the barriers remain the same. The civilization should be independent, thriving on its own. The process of planning the 100-year starship could also positively affect life on Earth, seeing as any efficient developments could be used immediately for everyday life and testing. In return, there are some advancements everyday life has offered to space travel. One of those is blockchain. Blockchain is a type of database that collects information together in blocks, and when filled, the blocks are chained onto the previously filled block, 
forming a chain of data using cryptography. Blockchain could be used to optimize resupply journeys by providing real-time information for better scheduling or simply be used as an efficient database to manage material. Quantum computing, the study of how to harness the unique properties of quantum mechanics used to solve problems on Earth, has been incorporated into optimization for space missions, like the rovers sent to Mars. This type of system allows for a complexity of computation that would be impossible on traditional devices. Such technology could fundamentally change scientific research. Advanced ecosystems like Internet of Things are contributing to space exploration as well. Internet of Things is a system of interrelated computing devices, machines, objects, animals or people, provided with unique identifiers and the ability to transfer data over a network without requiring human interaction. Internet of Things could be used in a spaceship for monitoring crucial systems like nuclear power and life support systems. It could also be used for real-time communication, data processing and predictive analytics so that researchers can understand data from space exploration. To add to this list of technology, space exploration could use another Earth-functioning development known as machine learning. Machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence designed to imitate the way that humans learn. The purpose is to speed up the learning process drastically and improve accuracy by removing human error. This type of learning could come into place for collision avoidance maneuvers since the human brain does not function as quickly as a computer. The automation of tasks paves way for spacecraft to become cognitive machines that can make critical decisions so humans can spend more time on complex research activities. Billions of Earth years has brought resilience to the human species while, at the same time, brought deterioration to the land and ecosystems who live beside us. Those who've worked in the past have made it feasible for us to reverse the ruinous nature we impose and to go interstellar in search for Earth 2, a second home. There is no direct approach to space travel, no one method, no confirmed settlement, and no expectation of what we will find and how we will operate. Come the future, our common method of travel and the planet we choose to reside may not align with any of our spirited fantasies. There are mysteries that ride on the sun's rays, majesties in the swirling gases and chunks of matter, and humans will benefit by learning to see other worlds, other events where they are for what they are, as surely as they benefit by having air, water and soil. The historical struggle repeated now in ourselves has always been to get a big enough picture, and now we stand at an exciting place, one world trying to figure out the others. Holmes Rolston III. That is all for this video, thank you for watching. Like and comment videos you want to see and subscribe to keep the story alive.